Disposable and single use are common terms in our vocabulary. They imply that the materials that surround us are temporary, but they're far from it. Picture this. You've gone on a run at the park. You're tired, you run out of water, so you buy a water bottle. You drink it, and you toss it in the recycling bin when you're done. That same night, you go to a restaurant. You don't finish your meal, so you ask for a to-go box. You use this styrofoam box for two days before you toss it away in the garbage when done. We never have to think about these objects past the time that they were useful to us. But they all still exist, and they will outlive us, our children, and grandchildren too. Recycling alone is an incomplete solution. Half of all plastics ever made are only used once, and only 10% are ever recycled. Think of recycling as putting a bucket under a water leak. It buys us time. We have to do it. But it doesn't fix the problem. The problem is manufacturing. We need to stop making materials that take 30 minutes to use and 300 years to degrade. In fact, we've known the damages of plastics for decades, but we continue to use them, and production continues to rise every year. The reason? They're cheaper to make than recycled ones. But the story, the story of our material impact doesn't end with plastics. In our global economy, products are intentionally designed to break down after a certain amount of time. This is a practice known as planned obsolescence. It drives demand by encouraging users to replace or upgrade their products. This is very common in electronics. We plan for product breakdown, but we do not plan for material breakdown. Although the Industrial Revolution was only a few hundred years ago, it should be unsurprising that all human-made objects have now surpassed all living biomass by weight. This is a critical flaw of our global manufacturing practices. So what are the consequences of using cheap, long-lasting materials? Large accumulations of waste in our oceans. A famous example of this being the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, estimated to be three times the size of France. An absurd amount of garbage floating in the ocean, damaging ecosystems, wildlife, and ultimately, human health. So now that we have collective anxiety about the state of the world, what can we do? For biology, waste is not a flaw. It's a key feature of manufacturing. An animal's waste, it's a microbe's meal. And that microbe's waste feeds the soil that nurtures the forest. Through these simple biochemical interactions, a vast metabolic network emerges. This ability to feed and be fed by life is nature's embodiment of resilience. Nature adapts, it can evolve, and it is capable of creating self-sustaining ecosystems. There is much we can learn from nature when it comes to waste management and manufacturing. In fact, the instructions for strong biodegradable materials are written in the language of life, DNA. Take trees. Most of their weight comes from non-living proteins embedded in their cell walls for structural support. Think of the exoskeleton of a beetle. It is a strong and flexible armor, mostly made of chitin, a fibrous polymer of sugar molecules. As the insect grows, the insect sheds its armor, allowing room for a bigger one, while the old one decays, and it continues its cycle through the ecosystem by being used by other organisms. It is time we recognize that humans are not the best makers on Earth. Nature is. My interest in biomanufacturing started when I learned about bacteria's natural ability to make cellulose, that same strong polymer found in tree trunks and cell walls. Through scientific collaborations, I began prototyping single-use biodegradable products made of bacterial cellulose, such as medical gauze and biofilm packaging. But in a world of thousands of interests in biopolymers, I began wondering, what are the hurdles for biomaterials to succeed? Remember, just as new plastics are still cheaper to make than recycled ones, how can we financially scale up any biomanufacturing? There's been millions of dollars invested in biomaterial research and businesses since the COVID pandemic. We continue to see increased ingenuity of the materials used, such as mycelium, chitin, and even silk proteins. But there's a major hurdle of this emerging industry. 
the premium price of its products associated with the chemicals needed for their making. For biomaterials to succeed, they must be able to compete with the non-degradable alternatives, both in utility and their cost. Historically, we have only used a handful of microbes for making products such as human insulin. We insert the DNA blueprint of our product inside this microbe under the premise that they will make them as they make their own proteins. But this approach gives microbes a what without a why. If a cell doesn't need a protein for its survival, it's not going to prioritize its making as much as it could. This is a critical problem when it comes to bulk materials, as they must be able to compete in production rates and cost of manufacturing with the non-degradable alternatives. But bioengineering is not the only alternative. We may discover new metabolic pathways if we're looking for microbes in the right environment. In the era of next generation sequencing, it has never been cheaper and easier to sequence and discover new species. A 2016 study funded by the NSF estimated that there are about one trillion microbial species on Earth, and 99.999% of them remain to be discovered. Just last year, the Two Frontiers Project led an underwater expedition to a volcanic site in Sicily. They were searching for microbes capable of trapping carbon dioxide. This is a critical endeavor as carbon dioxide concentrations continue to rise every year in our atmosphere. Not only did they find microbes at the bottom of this volcanic site, but when they were compared with the gold standard of carbon capture, they outperformed our best engineered microbes. Their environment demanded that they learn how to use carbon dioxide, so they evolved to do that with efficiency. By combining microbial discovery with bioengineering, we may invent a new type of industry that uses local waste as a source of energy, industrial ecosystems. An industrial ecosystem is a multi-species collaboration of self-replicating tiny cells that each work as a factory. Through metabolic networks, the industrial ecosystem uses sources of waste as energy to grow rather than assemble biodegradable products. In fact, the more that an industry resembles an ecosystem, the cheaper it will be to manufacture with it, as it will be capable of using multiple sources of waste, transform them, and use them for their production cycles. By harnessing the power of environmental microbes, we have an opportunity to revolutionize global waste management. A team of scientists and I are currently working on using byproducts from the milk industry, such as acidic whey, to feed biomaterial production with bacterial cellulose. This approach not only mitigates the damage that is done to ecosystems by the local waste streams, but it also paves the way for a reduction of price of biomaterial production at an industrial scale. By combining local waste streams with compatible microbes, we may invent new ecosystems Paper mills, black liquor, and starchy food waste from food processing are just some examples of global sources of waste that are suitable for industrial ecosystems. By turning our attention to ecosystems that have similar biochemistry, such as salt lakes and estuaries, we may find microbes that are capable of detoxifying and transforming these waste sources, making them key allies in our sustainability efforts. Inspired by the biochemical balance of nature's ecosystems, our goal is clear, to create a new industry that sees waste management as a key element of sustainable manufacturing, not just an afterthought. The biggest challenges we'll face in the 21st century is finding harmony between the ecosystems we inhabit and our current global industrial practices. Sustainability is key for the longevity of Earth, and even more important as we go into space in long-duration spaceflight. To remediate the damages we've done to ecosystems, we need to stop seeing nature as the subject of our dominance, and rather see them as our collaborators. I believe we're at the brink of the next industrial revolution, the bio-industrial revolution. Thank you. <laughs>